there, Crash? Roll. Andrea Vecchio, interview two, take two. <laughs> Before I wrote Live Your Playlist, I really felt broken. I had a professional mentor in my life who I idolized and who had done some great things for me, but ultimately really broke me down. There was a friendship there, and that friendship ended, and I felt as though that was someone who had betrayed me, and I had other friendships in my life, and they were there during good times, and then suddenly I looked around and I felt like many of them were gone, and they were people who I loved and cared about, and I expected that they would be there. Um, not only during the good times, but during the bad times too. And I also had this lump on my back and I didn't know what it was and it just kept getting bigger. And I was definitely nervous about it. Um, I knew that I was going to have to be operated on. I didn't know what they were gonna pull out. And I had already felt so beaten anyway. I was a successful professional woman who suddenly didn't have a job. I was someone who thought she chose her friends so well, and some of those people were gone. And I had always treated my body well. I was careful about what I put into it. And suddenly that was in question too, because I didn't know what was going on inside. So I definitely was feeling broken when I put pen to paper, or fingertips, to the computer when I was writing Love Your Playlist. But I ultimately feel that those difficult things that we go through, life's challenges, are what add substance and texture and depth to our lives. And they make us a little bit less judgmental and definitely wiser moving forward. So I think that those really painful experiences helped me write a book that I wouldn't have necessarily written and go through experiences, real life experiences that other people can relate to, that maybe if I hadn't gone through them, my story wouldn't resonate with other people. And now I think it does because I knew when I wrote this book that I had to be honest and I had to be raw and I had to be vulnerable because I think people can see through BS I mean, you can when you're talking to somebody, and I didn't want it to be that way. I felt like the topics I was writing about were way too serious and um, way too emotional for people to treat them in a way that wasn't honest. Now, and were the uh, were the health scares and the the kind of betrayals from your close like connections? Did that all happen suddenly, or was that? Is that over time? Um, the difficult things that I went through, the house scare, the betrayal, the job loss, most people do over a span of many years, and I just happened to pack them all into five weeks. So week one, I lost my job. Week two, I found out that people who I really trusted had betrayed me. Week three, um, this relationship that I thought was going to be part of my future ended and, and hit the road. Um, there were some lingering effects from him, which um, caused a couple trips to the doctor. I had to have some tests done that scared me, um, honestly, and I write about it, but it's not even easy to say. I felt a little bit embarrassed. I had to have an HIV test taken, and that was definitely one of those moments where I thought, I never thought this would happen to me because I was so careful with my life and so um, careful about my body and so that call like waiting on that call and that result was life-changing for me that's when I did what I call God promises God if you get me out of this I promise that I will do this this and that or that I will never do this this or that again and um, I was making a lot of God promises during that time and luckily everything was good and um, my body was very clean um, but then I had one other test that needed to be taken after surgery and that was the lump that I had on my back um, and it was really big and so I knew going into 
that surgery, that everything else with me was healthy, but there was that one other test result that I needed to get. And I thought about people who wait for those results and people who get different answers than the one that I got. I was fortunate, I was lucky. Everything with me was healthy. Um, not everybody gets the same response, but I understood that feeling going into it, what it's like to think that you may get one phone call or one piece of paper that could completely change the course of your life. Um, that's a difficult thing to go through. That definitely, um, it breaks you down. Could you share with us an excerpt from the book? Sure. That talks about that. Um, I want to tell, well, before I do that, I want to talk about that um, lump. So I had just come home from a long trip where I flew in from Los Angeles interviewing one of the most famous people on the planet. I don't remember which one it was. It could have been George Clooney or Robin Williams or Denzel Washington. Um, but I remember getting home from that trip feeling exhausted and sore because I was on a small seat and my back hurt. And so I reached back and I was kind of massaging my back and I felt something and I knew my body well. And it was something that I'd never felt there before. It felt like a small lump. And I thought, maybe that's just like a knot or I don't know, maybe it's just like, you know, something that's like a soreness and it seems like there's a growth, but it's nothing. And a couple of weeks passed and a couple of months passed and it was still there, but I had long hair and it was on my back. So I didn't see it. It was out of sight, out of mind. And a few more months passed, seven months passed, eight months passed, and it keeps getting bigger, but I don't see it. I can feel it, but I don't see it. And so again, still out of sight, out of mind. Um, and then I lost my job and I went down to Florida and I had my hair pulled back in a ponytail and I was getting ready to go do one of my daily walks on the beach where I was going to work through what I had going on in my head and in my life through my music. And with my hair pulled back in a ponytail, my mom said, what is on your back? And we kind of joked that I was going to end up looking a little hunchback at the time, but she said, you need to do something about it. Like, this is not, this is not funny anymore. You need to go see a doctor. And I was nervous. I was nervous about it. What did you end up doing about it? Um, I, I spent a couple more months down in Florida. And then when I came home, I knew it was time to start getting my life in order, which meant making sure that I had a clean bill of health. So I called a local physician and I made an appointment and he felt around and said this is definitely something that needs to come out. Anytime we remove a lump from someone's body we need to send it to pathology to find out what it is. And you know, he couldn't say for sure. So I went through the surgery and I had the lump removed and I got a nice scar on my back about so big. The lump was about the size of my fist. He showed me a picture of it. It wasn't pretty. <laughs> um, but I guess it was sort of a metaphor for me because I felt like I literally and figuratively got the lump off my back. Because I, once I went through that surgery and found out that I had a clean bill of health and I, it wasn't cancer. So was, I knew from that point forward that um, everything's going to be okay. So, in writing Live Your Playlist, writing something that's so raw and honest and vulnerable can be very cathartic. And it's great when you're writing it because the stories just came very uh, easy. And I wrote freely. It wasn't until I published the book that I was like, Oh boy, <laughs> people are going to read this. Ah, <laughs> I don't know about this. And um, the first people to read this were my parents. Um, and I knew that they were going to be reading things about me that they didn't know. Because I wrote about stories that were very private to me. Things that I felt like I would keep private forever. 
I talk a lot about relationships in this book and um, I felt like I couldn't get